The following program is brought to you by TZ Productions, offering 40 years of media experience. Support also comes from viewers like you. Thank you. You're in for another power-packed half hour of insight and intrigue. This week, we welcome veteran author and filmmaker David Parks, one-on-one. -on -one. He served during the bloodiest period of the Vietnam War, trudging through the swamps and jungles, often wondering why he was even there. And alongside, he was keeping a diary and taking photographs, documenting the horror for what would become a book. GI Diary by David Parks was an exclusive first-hand account of the Vietnam War at a time when political and military leadership were keeping the reality hidden. It was an important part of history, and Parks is here to talk about it. He also talk about growing up in the shadows of his famous father, poet and artist, Gordon Parks. And he'll tell us why Kansas has such a special place in his heart. A half hour of powerful and engaging conversation is coming your way. One on One starts right now. Hello, I'm Victor Hawkstrom, and I'm honored to have David Parks here with me to share his fascinating story. David, welcome to One on One. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It's always good to get back to Wichita. <laughs> good. I like well, we're Wichita. happy to always have you in Wichita. Thank you. Now, you grew up um, in a very wealthy home. Uh, you uh, had an affluent family. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that life growing up. <clears throat> well, it's, I have to start back when I was about five. That's what I go back to. Uh, my father, Gordon Parks, was working with Life Magazine as a photographer. He was assigned to uh, France, Paris, Bureau. So the family moved there with him. We spent about five, five years uh, living in France, and that, that was really a beautiful trip. I did a lot of traveling with my father, uh, carrying bags, loading cameras, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother was also involved, and I have a sister, I had a sister, and my mother. They, they were pretty much home buddies, but my brother and I traveled with dad a lot. Had a chance to... And your brother was junior. Yeah, Gordon Parks, junior. Uh, <clears throat> and met a lot of great people. Saw a lot of great European... So brothers. you virtually will agree, then, that you were born with a silver spoon. Well, that's what I... I haven't seen the spoon, but... Uh, <laughs> as I said before... What, I, what happened to the spoon? Oh, what happened to the spoon? It, it, it turned into work. <laughs> I've been working with uh, my father and my brother for a long time. We, we did a lot of films. My brother directed Superfly, which was a very successful film. I raised the money for it and helped produce it. And we did Shaft. My father worked on uh, four or five of his movies as a production troubleshooter. We kind of had a family business going there. You know, producing movies and photography. Producing and photography, yeah. And I was a freelance still photographer for uh, the magazines in New York. Worked for Look, Life, Ebony, New York Magazine, Newsweek, you name, you know, freelance photography in New York was pretty rough. So you had to get what you can get. Now, your father, Gordon Parks, mm -hmm. well, um, is from Fort Scott, Kansas. Yes, sir. Uh, they celebrate his legacy in Fort Scott every year. Every year. Every year. He's buried there. The whole family is buried yes, in Fort Scott. Yes, they Scott. are. 
There's a museum in Footscar. Yes, it is. It's <laughs> Gordon Parks Museum. <laughs> and um, there's also a Gordon Parks school in Wichita. Yes. His papers and special collections are also yes. uh, at uh, Wichita State. Yes. Tell us, how do you perceive your father as you look back on him today? Oh, man, that's... Uh, you know, I worked with him so much, and we did, did so much traveling that he wasn't like a father. He was like a, someone I worked for <laughs> in, in terms of... Uh, photography and filmmaking and then so uh, he was a I'd have to say he was a renaissance man which was the term they gave him in New York City uh, they considered him the renaissance man he was prolific in everything uh, music he did a number of music scores he did some classical concertos that Leonard Bernstein, for example, played. How did he obtain his education? Well, uh, the, the music end of it came uh, from ear. He okay. did it, he didn't learn the uh, rudiments of uh, notes and stuff. He, he played from ear. He picked it up uh, pretty much in Fort Scott uh, from his mother. And uh, when he got to, uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis. He uh, played in juke joints and played in nightclubs, and he uh, really loved music. I mean, his he did the score for uh, Shaft's big score. He did the score for uh, the Odyssey of Solomon Northrup, which was uh, sh shot for PBS, by the way. Uh, he did. Uh, a number of different concertos, and but he 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 played in and uh, he played by ear, right. and he was very very good. What what kind of relationship did you have with him? Uh, <laughs> we got along, you know. We uh, uh, we didn't have time to have a problem. I mean, <laughs> didn't have time. <laughs> didn't to have, have time. Problem. No, he, we were busy all the time. Uh, as I said, I traveled with him a lot, and uh, we had kind of like a family business in a way, you can call it a business, but we all pitched in and tried to help him do what he needed to do. Now, you know? when you were growing up, you, 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 you had the best. You attended private schools. I was in private schools. Boarding schools. Boarding schools. Very expensive, I may add. Uh, he paid up the nose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you traveled the world. Yes. So the question is, did your father define you, and does he define you still? I would say so, yeah. I think like, I'm like any other kid who has a father who uh, brings them up, rears them into manhood. And, but he never was the type of person that laid anything on you. He uh, was the kind of person that said, I'm not going to tell you anything, but you need to learn what you see, learn from what you see. So, distinguish between David Park and Gordon Park. Hmm. Who are you, in other words, today as you look back on your life? That's, that's a, a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very independent, you know. Uh, I pretty much do what I want to do, and not all the time it's right, <laughs> but I do, I try to do the right thing. Uh, I've, I've learned from my father's mistakes, I've learned from my brother's mistakes. My brother made nine movies out of Hollywood, dad did about seven or eight of them. Uh, I worked on other movies like The Great White Hope. Uh, so what, what were those mistakes, the biggest ones that you learned from? Well, you, you learn how, you know, human behavior, you know, how to deal with problems, you know, how to deal with personalities, which this, the film business is full of those. 
uh, you learn how to learn from your mistakes. I made mistakes, I've made mistakes, I keep making mistakes. I only try to do them once. <laughs> Eh, give me twice, but if the third time comes around, I think I'm working on the wrong deal, you know? I <laughs> what, what if, what if uh, uh, David, what if Gordon Parks had not been your father? What would life be like today? I don't know. Today? I don't know. Uh, would it be better or worse? I don't know. I, I, you know, the thing is, is that you're, you're dealt a hand, okay, and you play that hand. What is the hand that was dealt to you? Oh, God. <laughs> Survival. You know, I think one of the things I learned from my brother and my father was you need to do things that will give you the opportunity to survive. Okay? You need to take on responsibilities that work in regards for your survival and do them the best you can and and I've done that. I've tried, tried doing that. I tried to uh, do the right thing. I've always tried to do the right thing. I learned that from him and my brother. And Gordon Parks Jr. was very good. I mean, you know, he probably had a harder time than I, I did because he was the firstborn. And that's usually pretty hard on, on the first one. But he survived very well. He died in 82. A plane crash while he was shooting a film in uh, Kenya, yeah. and that uh, that took the old man back a lot, you know, and took took the whole family hard. It gave us a hard uh, reality to uh, life and death. But I think uh, if my father was a garbage collector, I would have been maybe a garbage collector. I would have been a good one too. You know, anything, I mean, you are what, you are a product of your family, you know? And it just so happens that he was a photographer and a writer and filmmaker, and I grew up in that business. And it's funny that what happened was uh, after I got out of Vietnam, I uh, went back to college. And one of the things he asked me, he says, well, what are you going to do now? You know, I said, what do you mean? What am I going to do? I'm going to be a photographer. You know, you are? I said, you, you know, and I said, it's the only thing I know how to do, you know. Uh, and uh, it kind of, <laughs> I was shocked that he asked me what I'm going to do because I had never done anything other than work with him and work in the business. But, you know, uh, they tend to lose focus on, on children. But while, while you're in college, mm -hmm. you joined the military. No, it was, yes, I did. Uh, first two years the I went to, years, right. yeah, I went to Ricker College, which is a private, private, school, uh, private uh, in, Maine. in Maine, yes. And, liberal arts school and and I just one day after my I was there two years and <laughs> I uh, went up to a professor in accounting I was taking accounting and I asked him a question he says don't ask me read the book you know and I said what you know I have a I have a problem he says just read the book you'll get you know and I, so I got on the phone and I said, you know, Dad, I think you're wasting your money here. <laughs> you're wasting your money here because I can't get any, anything uh, accomplished. I can't get any answers. So after that year, I quit. And when I quit, I got drafted. So you didn't really develop an interest in the military? You no, no, drafted. I was drafted, you know. And uh, you were there for how long? I was there for a year. A year. And... Uh, one, one heck of an experience. And, and while you were there, mm -hmm. you began taking pictures, making, keeping a diary. Yes. With a plan in mind. Yes. Tell no, us about no, that. No, there was no plan. Uh, the, 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 the reason why I was taking pictures and keeping a diary was from the suggestion of my father. 
because I had told him when I was going through basic training and all, I said, this is some boring stuff. So he, so he suggests, he says, look, let, start taking some pictures, keep a diary, keep your mind occupied. occupied. And, uh, uh, and that, that might, you know, take some of the pressure off of the boredom, because the military is rather boring, especially when you're learning how to be a combat soldier. It wasn't boring when I got to Nam. <laughs> Vietnam. Yes, when I got to Vietnam, it was not boring. It was pretty heavy stuff, but military trained me very well. And but I. What did you learn? Oh, discipline. That's the number one thing I learned. Uh, I learned how to survive in a combat situation. Uh, I learned how to deal with horror and fear. And I learned more, more than anything that I learned, I went through a lot of fear like anybody else would in a combat situation. And, right. and I learned that fear gets the job done. Oh. <laughs> that, was, that was one it, of the things keeps that you, came, it, it keeps you surviving. It keeps you surviving because, <laughs> you know, you know it, it, so I learned how to deal with a traumatic situation like that. You know, but but after you left, yes, uh, I said earlier you had a plan with your notes and your photographs. Uh, I did. I didn't. But uh, you say you didn't, but you no. turned it into a book. I didn't turn it into the book. What happened was, I kept these notes. I kept this diary. I kept sending them back to my father. In a way to get them out of there, because I wasn't supposed to be doing that. Right. S but I snuck them through the mail. They weren't worrying about what we were sending back as much as what was coming at us, especially with the protests. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I was able to get them through. Uh, I got most of the book through by uh, Maury Safer was filming my unit, and uh, CBS was sh shooting us in combat. And I went over to him one day and I said, Maury, uh, my name's David Parks, uh, I'm the son of Gordon Parks. And I have some notes and diary and film that I was hoping that you could, when you get back to the States, give them to my father. Well, he did. He didn't give them to my father. He took them over to Life Magazine. And Life Magazine uh, got the material and they saw the footage and all that. And they, they printed up a lot of stuff. And they said, hey, this is pretty fascinating stuff. So it kind of was a fluke that life got their hands on it. And then uh, the, the editor from Harper and Row was at my father's house uh, for whatever reason. And the, his secretary came in with some laces. You got a letter from David, you know. And uh, so he opened up the letter and started reading it. And the editor, uh, thought it was fascinating that what I was saying, he says, well, I got a whole bunch of stuff from David here. And so she got a hold of it. Her name was Jean Young. She was the editor for my father on his books at Harper and Row. And she says, you know, Gordon, this would make a pretty good book. You know? And so that's how it took off. I did not originally write the diary or take photographs for it to be published. I was just doing something to take my mind off of what was going on in, the, in, in, in Vietnam and, and in, in the military. So and the title is? GI Diary. GI Diary. David Parks. And uh, you can Google that. You know. So what would you do differently if you had to live your life all over again? <laughs> hey, you ask this of, uh, you know, that's not an easy question. Well, I don't give it, know. Give it a shot. I really don't know. I, I really, I really don't know. I never had a chance to think about what I would do. I only had a chance to really think about what I was doing. I didn't even think about where I was going. And I'm, to this day, I don't think about where I'm going. All I know is what I learned working with dad and my brother and in the business of Life magazine, 
Warner Brothers and all the experiences I've had uh, that you just deal with the moment. If you can make the moment happen, the future will take care of itself, and that's pretty much what has happened for me. I don't think ahead in terms of what I want to do. I think about what I'm doing now, and I do the best job I can. So what has happened for you? Well, right now I'm an independent filmmaker. I do documentaries on, uh, I live in Texas, and I've been shooting a lot of documentaries on uh, Texas history. And I got into history. I, I really like history. I think it started back when I was going to school in France. And I adapted that instinct for history. Well, I went to French school. And we studied Napoleon. Of course. Napoleon I, <laughs> Napoleon II, Napoleon III. We studied art work that contained to his wars. And I think that's where I picked up the instinct about history. So uh, right now, the Texas legislature has proclaimed, gave me a proclamation based on my work in Texas on its history. Looking back at your life or on mm -hmm. your life from the beginning to right. now, any regrets? No. No. If you were to change anything, would there be any change you would make? Maybe get married. <laughs> you know, I'm not married. What stopped you? I never was asked. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth, you know. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've had some really good women friends, and I do now. And you know. D David, what could young people learn from the story of your life? Hmm. Well, I, you know, uh, perseverance, overcoming uh, adversity. I mean, it, it hasn't been easy. I mean, I've had problems uh, with various incidents in my life. But the thing I, I try to emphasize to kids when I lecture, I do a lot of lecturing on, on the, the college circuit and the high school circuit. And one of the things I said, you know, the only way you can uh, uh, become a person uh, that is successful and competent, forget successful, competent, is that <clears throat> you have to be able to identify your mistakes. You have to be able to admit, I made mistakes. And you need to take the mistakes you've made and you need to turn those mistakes around. So, so what were the biggest mistakes or the one big <laughs> mistake you've made? Oh, God, there's been a number of them. <laughs> well, what's the biggest one? Oh, man. That, that, that's a hard question. I, I, I think the biggest mistake is I never really learned business. I really was, I wish I was a better businessman. <laughs> I, I really do. I, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I'm a lousy businessman. Uh, I, 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 you give me a, a million dollars, I, I wouldn't know what to do with it. You know, I really wouldn't. I, ne I, ne I never was brought up to think about money in terms of survival, you know, uh, to make a living. Do you know why is that? I never had a chance to, to, to know, I mean, when you're, when you're dealing with a, my family situation, and I never had a chance to think about not having it. Because it was always there? It was always there. And they never showed me any, my mother taught me a lot about money, but she taught me how to ride the bus, the subway, how to take care of my, my body, and, you know, uh, thank God for mothers. You know, because my father, he never even showed me how to change a tire because he didn't really, number one, have time to do that. I mean, he was a very busy man. When you look at what he has done uh, in terms of uh, his, uh, his art, there was no time to sit down and talk about, and, and he might have wanted to, you know, say to me, 
well, you might want to do it this way. Or might that way. Never had a chance. He would acknowledge when I made mistakes, you know. He would let me know when I made mistakes. So, so what could parents learn from your situation, your experience? Well, although, I don't, you, although you're not one. I, yeah, I, I don't think you could use my family. We were a dysfunctional family because we've always been since the old days where we split up. My brother was in L.A., my sister was in Paris or living in England. I'm living in Texas. So we, we really, but we always got together like at Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was uh, a time where we'd all sort of come back together and boom. But uh, uh, I've always been, my father always encouraged me to do my thing. You know, he never laid, matter of fact, he didn't even want me to be a photographer. He says, this, this is a, re, you know, he thought it was, it, it can get kind of ridiculous. I mean, you're in the media business. You know how ridiculous this can get. Uh, but I, as I said, I don't know how to do anything else. So when I run into a problem, I, I, I make it work. That's a lesson that I learned as a child growing up. I'd like to conclude this interview with right. a word game. All right. Are you ready to play with me? Ready to play. All right. Um, you tell me the first thing that pops into your head <laughs> okay. when I say these words, okay. one at a time. First word, fear. What, what pops into my mind, yes. fear. Fear gets the job done. Bravery. Stupidity. Foolishness. Stupid. <laughs> Love. Respect. And the last word, faith. Oh, the gods. Allah, Buddha, Dalai Lama, Jesus Christ, all of them. Uh, <clears throat> that I, I love them all, and I have, uh, and I've called on God before. On that note, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure you, having you. You asked some serious questions. <laughs> 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 you know, they're 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 uh, they're, they're pretty pretty very good. Well, thank very you. Good. Thank you. It's good having you. Thank you, sir. It's good to be here. And it was an honor to share this half hour with you. Let us know what you think about the program, good or bad. The email address is one-on-one -on -one at kpts.org. I'm Victor Hawkstrom. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time for another edition of One-on-One. -on -One. The preceding program was brought to you by TZ Productions, offering 40 years of media experience. Support also comes from viewers like you. Thank you.